but I've seen you, a lot of you over the years. Um, for those of you who don't know me beyond being the person who's the craziest person behind the registration desk, um, I live in Manchester. I am not a free stater. I have lived here for a couple decades now. Um, I'm very active in the Republican Party. I also happen to be a state representative. Um, did anybody here read the article in the National Telegraph this week? They ran a really nice article about Liberty Forum, with, you know, really positive and upbeat. And I caught one part, and I hope nobody's offended by my clarification of this, but it said um, there was going to be a panel on running for office as a libertarian. And I thought, well, now that's interesting. Because this panel is so not about running for office as a libertarian, because this panel is about running for office and actually getting elected. And that may be insulting to somebody, but it's not meant to be insulting. It's meant to be reality. The reality is, is in the state of New Hampshire, we have had we have one state rep that has been elected as a libertarian. He is also elected as a Democrat and a Republican. <laughs> so he's an anomaly. So we can't use him as an example. So anybody who ever wants to come to New Hampshire and get involved in an election, and as much as I appreciate the ballot access efforts that the Libertarian Party does and that whole thing, you really almost have to decide what is your goal. Is your goal to get elected to affect change and actually have a vote in the process? Or is your goal to get ballot access? Or is your goal just to get your message out there during the campaign? Because they are actually three different goals. I happen to pick, get me elected, and then you know we'll see where we are. As somebody who's very Republican in background, um, I've worked on a lot of campaigns. I've worked on state senate campaigns. I've worked on U.S. Senate campaigns. I've worked on presidential campaigns. I worked on one of our panelists, Alderman campaigns. Ballot initiative? You did I did a that. very big ballot initiative on spending yeah. caps. So I've done all those things. And then I got elected. And you know what? Sometimes I'm, I surprise myself because I would never think of myself as a libertarian, really. I'm a small L libertarian, yeah, yeah. And as the year goes on, Mark, who was our top um, liberty rated rep in the first year, and I think both Phil and I were both in the top 25. Um, as every time we pat vote on some of these issues, I look around and I start thinking about it. I'm like, damn, I don't know how this happened, but I'm chasing Mark's wheels. <laughs> you miss one day, buddy. And I, 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 I got you. Because I shouldn't be the pro liberty rep in my view. I'm a GOP girl. I shouldn't be right. super strong libertarian, very pro liberty rating. Because if I am, my God, there should be a ton of you in the state house. Because I never really thought of myself as a libertarian before. But now I'm starting to say, wow, I guess I'm a libertarian. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, so that was my, my pitch. My, it, there's a lot to running for office. You have to be serious about it. You have to decide what your goals are and which path you want to choose. If you're just out there to get a message out about, you know, legalizing pot, that's fine. <laughs> but if you think that you're going to get elected on an issue of legalizing pot, dream on. Because guess what? I don't care if you're the best candidate in the world and you work 24 hours a day, you are not getting elected on that issue. Not in this state of New Hampshire. Now, take your while. But you're still not going to get elected on the issue. So on that note, um, I'm going to introduce Phil. This is Phil Griazzo. Um, well, Phil is the first Republican alderman ever elected in my district. Ever. Wow. Can you explain it? We live in Manchester. We're, the, uh, we're a city. So we have 12 wards in our city. Our city is broken up into 12 equal segments. And the aldermen are who run the city. You have the mayor and these 12 aldermen. Well, we actually have 14 council, aldermen. Right? Well, they're the city council, but we call, in our city, they're aldermen. So we actually have 14 aldermen. We have two at large, which that's a whole other debate. Um, and in our district, because we both live in the same district, we had somebody who was there for a long time, like 30 some years. Four. Mm -hmm. Four. Bill Cashin. Bill Cashin. Okay. Bill Cashin. And then he he pretty much handpicked his successor. He was a Democrat. He handpicked his successor, and Phil ran against him, and we lost. Oh. By 220 votes, if I recall. <laughs> Something like that. It wasn't a lot. 
but it was it was close. We were very disappointed because Phil worked his ass off. Um, so we ran again, and we used some unique ideas because people think you have to run in New Hampshire and say, "I'm going to lower your taxes and I'm not going to spend money," which is true. But good luck with that because if it was that easy, we'd elect small L libertarian Republicans all day long, and we can't. So for Phil and I, because I worked as his campaign manager, we had to take a unique up, up approach. We actually targeted dog owners, because yep. we built a dog park with no tax money, and our aldermen didn't like that. We found <laughs> issues. Yeah. We were going to build a dog park anyway, but boy, were we going to build a dog park. So instead of just targeting the same old, same old people, we decided we were going to target Democrats that own dogs. <laughs> They like dogs, we like dogs. Guess what? They vote for you because of something stupid like you own a dog. So we targeted them. It's true. I, it is very true. And it, that's what I always find interesting about campaigns is a lot of campaigns, and I'm sure you got this, in, this advice from the state GOP. Go after the hardcore Republicans. Go after the Republicans that come out every time. Go after the Republicans that come out of three out of four times. We, they call them four out of fours and three out of fours. Well, if it was that easy, we just get elected. Just call the four out of fours and the three out of fours. That's easy. Except for there's only a third of the population is Republican. So you can get all the Republicans, and the Democrats can get all the Democrats, and guess what? Now you start fighting for those people in the middle. And sometimes I think the Republican Party in New Hampshire misses that a little bit. Um, so you have to be creative. You have to figure out how many people you need to vote, how many people you need to win, and what is different about those people that you can appeal to so that you can get the chance to sit there and push the little red button to say, yeah, no, I'm not going to overturn the, the bill to decriminalize marijuana. No, I'm not going to say no to that. And until we have more people in the state house, not that we don't have a bunch now, I was, I'm very happy about the thought of having you know, 20 of us up here because the last Liberty Forum, I think we were, there were two. Two Liberty reps. No, three. Three Liberty reps. Jen Coffey, Cal Pratt. Carol Meyer. Carol. Carol oh, okay, so four. Four. Woohoo. Now, on any given day, we can't even necessarily identify exactly who to call Liberty reps, but we probably have between 40 and 80 hmm. on any given vote that are pretty damn strong, small L libertarian Republicans. And that makes a big difference. So anyways, on that note, this is Phil Grazzo. I'm going to let him talk about overcoming hurdles when you run for office. You want to introduce everyone else you want to go? No, we can go through, unless you want to. Okay, so so uh, Tammy talked about overcoming hurdles, and you can run to legalize pot and all those other issues. You could pick, you could pick an issue. You could pick whatever issue you want, and if that's a controversial or difficult issue, um, you're going to be stuck with that label for however long it takes. Um, in my case, I came to New England uh, long before the Free State Project was ever even an idea. I've been here for almost 15 years, uh, so I call myself a pre-stater because I came here beforehand. I'm not, I'm not a native, um, but I, when I came here, I started uh, the New Hampshire Organization to Reform Marijuana Law, and that was the issue that I worked on to um, restore New Hampshire's medical marijuana law that it had in place for nearly 20 years. Uh, and then every time that I had run for election, I'm the guy who wanted to legalize drugs, and that's what they used to keep me from getting elected. And it took me about 10 years to overcome that campaign of theirs. And eventually people realize that you're not some nut, you're not trying to legalize drugs, you're just trying to restore a law that helps sick and dying people. But it's politics, and that's not the way that obviously your, op your opposition is going to portray that. They're going to portray you as some crazy guy who just wants everybody to have drugs. So you. You, you definitely have to decide, like Tammy said, which way you're going to go. If you want to be an activist who wants to raise an issue, stick with that. If you want to be elected, don't necessarily pick up the issue. Get elected, and then you can actually vote on the issue that you wanted to change and, and try to change the minds of the other folks that are uh, elected, and that's that's happening. As you can see, we've got you know 40 to 80 liberty-minded individuals. Um, you could also run as a, a, a libertarian, a Democrat, a Republican, independent. You're going to have a harder time running as an independent or a libertarian because, unfortunately, we have the two-party system. 
and people that are registered to vote or have strong beliefs that are the ones that come out and vote are usually registered one or the other. Uh, if, if, you, if I might recognize my friend in the back there, John Babiars, who was the chair of the Libertarian Party. <laughs> I was the vice chair of the Libertarian Party. And uh, at one point, John and I realized we're just not getting the success that we should be getting. Let's take a different approach. Let's get somebody to become a Democrat. Let's get somebody to become a Republican, and we'll start working from the inside. John went, um, I think you, well, I think John ran as a Democrat. I ran as a Republican. He ran for governor and was very, very instrumental in working with Craig Benson to bring the Free State Project to New Hampshire. As, as a sitting governor, he invited the group to come, and that's a, a lot to do with, with John's efforts. I, being, uh, I grew up in Arizona, so uh, you know, Barry Goldwater is a standard bearer for my, I guess, Republican beliefs for the most part. Um, so I, I, I tend to identify with them most. So I, I took the Republican track, and I've been working with Republicans for quite a while and changing minds and doing what I can to get them to move over towards the libertarian leaning ideals of what their party really is. You know, there's a lot of crossover between libertarians and Republicans, and, there, and there's there's some issues that aren't, but in New Hampshire we have a lot of, of Republicans that call themselves libertarian leaning. So you, you, you could identify with, with one of those groups or you can run as a Democrat, which is a little bit harder because they've been drinking the Kool-Aid a little bit uh, a, a little bit more often and uh, aren't necessarily open to some of the things that we're trying to accomplish. But the Republicans are definitely there. They just need a little nudge. So I decided to go the Republican route and I've been pretty successful. As Tammy said, we, it, it, and of course, rule number one, listen to Tammy. <laughs> Tammy rule number two? Don't listen. piss Tammy off. <laughs> um, that is a rule in the state house, just so you know. We, we, rule number one in the state house is actually be a good neighbor. So whoever you're sitting next to, you know, be nice to them because they're your neighbor. Rule number two is don't piss off Tammy. Yeah. Tammy's, Tammy's definitely a good ally. She's helped me tremendously, and I, I can never thank her enough. Uh, we took a seat in the city of Manchester that's never been held by a Republican. Um, so we, we've got that. And then we started winning state rep seats. And, and now we're looking for other things. But we've always all along been working with individuals in the state that are as close to what we're ever going to get as an ideal candidate. So we work with governors. We work with um, mayors, con people that are in Congress. It's it just you've got to sort of obviously pick where you want to go. So you, like I said, you could be an activist. Stick with activism. Because if you get yourself labeled and you become uh, well known for what you're doing, it's going to be harder for you to transition over to politics. If you wanted to be elected, go go out and run a campaign, but don't don't come up with a crazy idea and say you elect me because of this. You might not ever get elected. How about if you run to get elected, with the with in the back of your mind knowing that this is what I really want to do. Just don't talk about it until you get in there, and then when you get in there, quietly go around individually and talk to all the people that you need to do to get to convince to press the button to vote your way. And that way, you've actually you actually now have the opportunity to have say in what happens or what doesn't happen. And that's more effective than standing on the outside of the room, banging your head against the wall saying, do this, do this, that they're never going to do. So you you've, you've definitely have to pick your battles and, and figure out the best way to get in there. Uh, and then obviously the party the party issue, picking, picking uh, the best route. You know, a lot of people that I've seen get elected decide that, or I shouldn't say decide, they look at the statistics. They say, okay, this this district is Democrat. I'm going to register as a Democrat and run as a Democrat. Or I'm going to register as a Republican and, and, and run as a Republican. You've got to get to know the people in your neighborhood. Uh, one big thing that I will tell all of you, once, you, once you're here in New Hampshire, you're not from wherever you came from. You're here now. You're, you're from New Hampshire. So if somebody says, oh, where are you from? Well, I'm from Milford. I'm from Nashua. I'm from Concord. Not, I'm from Arizona, and in Arizona we used to do this, because then all of a sudden they're going to be done talking to you because you're just here to change our state, and that's not what we want. Obviously, we're all coming here because it's a good state, and we want to keep it the way that it is and make it better. The folks that are native to this, this state and uh, believe that the group is trying to usurp the, the state itself, uh, they don't like that. Uh, there's plenty of natives that like it, but you've got to do it in a way that you don't Put them off that you that they think that you're here to take away their state. You got to kind of get them to understand you're actually here because you love their state and you want to actually keep it the way that it is and not let it be destroyed. So there's there's definitely a lot of thought given to how to approach it and and, and the right direction to go. So and then we have all the state legislature.
later. He's, he's back to being a pot guy, by the way, this, this week. We'll talk about yeah, that. You can talk about that. <laughs> no, I, I, didn't, all, I didn't sponsor any of no. those bills. There's, all, there's, all, there's, all, there's also strategy. That's that's a whole other. Yeah, um, um, yeah. If you live in Alton Keene, towards Keene, and your name's Chuck Week, don't sponsor the pot bill. <laughs> <laughs> Get somebody um, else to sponsor it, and yeah. then work everybody else um, to vote for it. So when when we when this panel got handed over to me, I went through my banks and I was trying to think like, so who else knows about running for elections and has something different to contribute to it? And um, I thought of Honey. Unfortunately, though, because Honey ran in a special election, which is a whole nother gamut of um, politics that most people don't understand. And unfortunately, Honey didn't win. And it's not because Honey didn't work. She worked it's because, campaign. yes. And so I was hoping that she could share with us some of the hurdles of winning a special election, and maybe if there were any hurdles about being identified as a free stater when you're trying to win a tough election. I mean, one thing that um, I learned on the campaign is to question my concept of even what a Republican is. For instance, you know, when you even get look at like the four out of fours or whatever, I started looking down them like, oh, I thought those were Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the thing is, is then you go up to people who had voted, you know, in the primaries and everything as Republicans, and they'd self-identify as Democrats. Because, I mean, there's nothing to stop a Democrat from registering as a Republican and voting in a Republican primary just to swing. So, so some of these designations that we give to people of like, oh, you're this and you're that, aren't quite accurate. And it is probably more accurate to say that New Hampshire is a state of independence. Mm -hmm. And there's just a few people who might like fit the profile but then you know you even have to, have to ask yourself what the heck is a, a Republican? Because uh, you know even within like the Republican Party, though in my time there was a bit of a they were in, undergoing already like uh, a fight between what they call rhinos, people who vote for more spending, and you know people who would like the thought of themselves as more liberty Republicans. So then I started to get me confused because I'm like, well, I'm a Liberty Republican too. <laughs> and it starts to become confusing as to exactly who am I with here. And I think, you know, you just have to, you know, understand your own platform and adhere to that. Now they have their own platform, you know, the Republican platform, and you go through it. And technically, they consider you a good Republican if you meet 90% of that. I think it's 80. 80%, 20% is 80, 20s. Yeah, so if you can look at that platform and say to yourself, well, yeah, 80% of this, me too. So then, you know, okay, fine. You know, you're running that way. I'm like supporting, I was getting support from Republicans in my county. But because I think, you know, a lot of, I was running in a special election, which I didn't even know what the next special election was until I was in the middle of it. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently what a special election is, is that it's run off season, and suddenly you are the poster child for your party. Yeah, it, all the attention on you. If there are 400 Republicans running, there is one. And you're trying to get people out of their houses like in the middle of summer, or depending on when it's held. And it's not on their radar. So now you're driving them crazy. Why should they come out? Why should they drop what they're doing to their summer vacation and vote for you? Well, apparently, the way the Democrats do this is they invoke fear <laughs> into the populace. And by, by jacking up the adrenaline of the lecture, it, they get them out to vote. Unfortunately, you know, they do that by, by demonizing somebody else. And, you know, that is an effective cattle prod to get people out there. But, you know, you have to ask yourself whether or not you want to do that yourself. And, you know, okay, fine, I really wasn't, I'm not quite to that level of cutthroatness. Where they were, I mean, they were um, writing letters in the, in the editorials. First, they were telling people that I was hiding something. I don't know if you've ever tried to tell people that you're not hiding something, but it's really tricky to prove that. <laughs> and then the other idea was that, oh, I was a free stater and I was hiding that issue and... Because it wasn't on your literature. Because it wasn't on my literature. Today, yesterday we went to a Democrat meeting because well, they invited us, technically. They didn't know they were inviting us, but they did. Um, 
And they still had attached to that idea, oh, you didn't put it on your literature. You're hiding it. You know, like, well, you know, and my husband pointed out, he's like, you know, it, it just sometimes is confusing. I mean, you're running on issues. You put the issues on, there's only so much space on literature. If you put out a free stater, like, people are like, well, what the heck is that? I mean, it opens up a whole other can of worms without actually explaining anything. And you've only got, like, this much space to explain yourself on some of these pamphlets anyway. So, I mean, that's why I hadn't put it on. But when it came up, like, I was like, yes, you know, I signed the pledge. But there's all this confusion as to what a free stater actually is. And during my campaign, they used the um, union emails to send all sorts of inflammatory messages about what that was. But we could not refute that because we didn't have access to the union emails. So, I mean, <coughs> and, and they managed to, like, I don't know, twist the idea. For instance, well, they had what last night they had a in the Dover Democrat meeting, they had somebody speak about who free staters were. But she, she apparently there's a woman who's doing her thesis on it. And so we went, because we, that's our favorite subject. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, what did they have to say? And they were very, they, they were under the impression that, um, oh, I'm sorry, I forget his name. Um, Jason Sorens? Jason Sorens basically controls all our minds <laughs> <laughs> and has some means of funding this whole operation. <laughs> Who, who's funding? Sorry. I don't know. Somebody Jason Sorens knows, or him. Oh. I don't know. But I mean, so funding. It, it Coke, was. Is it Coke funders? Yeah, well, Coke, they're, they're funding the funders. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so they That's keep going, well, who's organizing this? And they're like, well, you know, you know they do have a website. And they throw the forum and the and the thing, but you know it's not like they actually mess it. It just becomes very complex to explain that we've kind of come to the same thought at once, and therefore are just doing what we think is right, and that we are not being told to do that <laughs> by by somebody so else. A known man that knows. Yeah. So Jason. who's thinking your thoughts for right. you? And you're like. Actually, I'm thinking my own thoughts. Well, how you know? How do you organize? You know? Well, we get. It seems like a good idea at the time. <laughs> and um, and uh, I guess we are somewhat of an example of spontaneous order. That you know, you, when I went to run for office for a special election. I looked at my husband and said, okay, this is you, this is me, we'll go. And it's very interesting that, you know, when you decide to like, okay, I'm going to stand up for something, how many people just show up and help you when you decide, okay, I'm going to stand up for this? Because, I mean, what caused me to do it was that we had tried to get Republicans in office in 2010 just because, you know, you'd watched the previous administration and they had attacked homeschoolers and they'd run up the budget. So that was what I wanted basically to defend, but it was very difficult to defend that in the 2011 year because, well, it was all taken care of. We'd already elected all the Republicans and <laughs> the homeschoolers were no longer under threat. And so it's almost, sometimes you almost need a threat in order to stand up and defend it. <laughs> to give people a reason to have to come out and elect you. Right. And it's very difficult to say, well, because this could happen, but it's unlikely because, you know, my opposition is going to be outnumbered in the electorate. But, you know, <laughs> still the principle stands. You know, it's really hard to get elected on principle. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, but it's just not emotional enough. <laughs> you want right. to have it? Right. A quick side of campaign as a Republican in a heavily Democratic district. So, you know, he didn't think he was going to win. He didn't, but he got the message out. And uh, he's been a good supporter of other campaigns. Frank Zabel right here is going to run for sheriff, county sheriff as a constitutional sheriff. Uh, Phil already mentioned John Babiars, who was the governor uh, candidate for the LP last year. He's a great candidate. Uh, Emily Sandblade in the back, not only is an awesome campaign manager, but she also ran at the town level, again, in an in a 
heavily uh, outnumbered district, but did a great job. And I don't know who else. Jackie, Jackie's run before. Who else? Rosalie. She was on the budget. Oh, yeah. oh Rosalie. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And it's even, even though we're, we're sort of concentrating on state office, let's point out that it's also easy to get elected at the town level. And that's where you can do a lot of good and stop a lot of the damage that goes on at these local, at the local level. And that's where all your money is spent. That's where all the property taxes are spent. So if you run for school board, uh, budget committee, planning board, please do it. Oftentimes, you just, you'll win just by showing up and put your name on the list because nobody else does. Uh, but I, I used to be an LP candidate in Nevada and uh, found out you couldn't win as an LP, so I ran as a Republican, found out there was no place for a libertarian-leaning Republican either. But I was successful here in New Hampshire. This is a good year for Republicans. So a lot of it just has to do with timing and the district you're running in. And Honey ran an awesome campaign. She did twice as much campaign as I did, but I was in a good year where all the Republicans, just because you had R next to your name, you got in. So uh, timing, timing's a big part of it, what? You got a great sign. I had <laughs> excellent signage. Um, Mooney over here, Mooney was my campaign manager. Eileen was my grassroots organizer, yeah, manager. And that, a lot of that place comes into play. But anyway, let's, uh, let's take some questions. Oh, okay. yes. Money? Just a quick comment. Uh, Phil mentioned that he used to, uh, 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 he, he ran as a Libertarian Party candidate. He's not the only one. Kingsbury was a Libertarian Party candidate. Now he's a state representative as a Republican. Uh, Steve Winter yeah. was in the Libertarian Party, he was in the Libertarian National Committee. He's now a state uh, representative as a Republican. Possibly more that I don't know. Sure uh, we, we, see that, that we, we see this movement. Question? Oh, hi. Uh, I actually had a question about the uh, choice of office to run for. So in my local town, um, there's a number of open positions right now. And I was wondering, uh, between the school board, planning, zoning, uh, which of those would be most uh, advantageous to run for? Well, good question. It is a very good question. It's a multi-part answer. The one that's going to have the most impact on your financial thing is going to be the school board. Because all more than half of all your tax dollars are spent in schools if that, a lot more. However, if you have the patience to sit on a school board, people have tried to convince me to run for school board a couple different times, and I'm like, you're insane. I, I watch some of their meetings. As much as yours are torturous to watch, theirs, theirs are so bad, because it is like, you have to have a strong resolve to be able to. A lot of patience. Yeah. But I mean, but that is probably out of those. I mean, zoning's important too. Planning. Planning is important, <laughs> but I mean, it's not going to have that same um, financial impact. But it might be a lot less. You might like keep your hair a little longer. I'm on a planning board in my town, which I hate because they're anti-property rights. You know, I'm in the minority. But I would say the most important ones are selectmen, or what Phil does, which is aldermen, city council, or school board. Those two is because that's where all the spending decisions are made. Thanks for running. John? Uh, Grafton has a uh, 100% libertarian planning board. <laughs> wow. So two libertarians that are up this time signed up, no opposition, because the other side has finally given up. In fact, <laughs> they tried to pull a fast one. We'll see how it goes uh, in March. But basically, they want to change it from elected to appoint it because they're, they can't get on anymore. People have seen <laughs> through it. But the other most important spot, I think, you know, you talk about selective, uh, selective or whatever. If you have a small town and you have a volunteer ambulance, volunteer fire, get on it. You get to know a lot of people yep. quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one way. Uh, it, the other thing is if you eventually, like myself, get a uh, fire chief, I am appointed by people inside the fire department. That's the way the structure of our town. So I cannot be removed unless they go to court. Second of all, in the event of a declared emergency, I am in charge. I am over the selectmen. I am in charge over the police chief. All town finances in the event of emergency. Don't let that go to your head, yeah. John. <laughs> 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 if you're concerned about people's liberty when FEMA gives yeah. a yep. order, you're the one in charge as fire chief. And the sheriff. Yep. John is in Grafton. I, this made me think of something else. In Grafton, when you run for local office, 
Is it uh, nonpartisan or is it partisan? It's nonpartisan. That's an interesting thing that I hadn't thought about until you said that. Minutes campaign right before a cemetery. <laughs> I well, the thing with a lot of local elections, and I don't know if it's in all towns, but it is the case in Manchester. In Manchester, we have nonpartisan local elections. So when you see the name on the ballot, it doesn't say Phil Grazzo Republican. It just says Phil Grazzo. And we we have a primary, and if there's five candidates, you could end up with two. Republicans running against each other. I mean, it doesn't always break down to one Republican, one Democrat, or what. The, but so you can um, avoid the party label a little bit more if that's a concern. But I still would recommend that if you're going to run, even in a nonpartisan election, as early as you can, pick a party affiliation on your when you vote. Because I will tell you, the first thing the parties will do is see what party you're registered. In. And if you're undeclared, they're going to be. I shouldn't say they won't help you because that's not true in Manchester. In Manchester, we have helped yeah. undeclared candidates, like in our voter guide, completely. We've actually helped um, indirectly some Democrat candidates because they're good Democrats or conservative Democrats. They just haven't figured it out yet. Um, but you don't want to like go and change your party affiliation the day before you sign up for office because they know. They trust us. Uh, the ones that people like me with the databases of the voters, I know, I know if you when you were a Republican and when you were an independent, when you were a Democrat, and that's for one of the first things I do. I do it when I get letters from my constituents. I wonder, I wonder about these guys. How many of you are planning to run either this year or the next couple of years? And how many of, are you all in New Hampshire? Yeah. And how many of you are going to run? I'm curious. Tell me where what town you're in. I, I'm curious. You don't have to tell me what town you're in. If you're going to run in a particular party, you don't have to tell us which party if you don't want to. Um, and if, what office? I am, I'm very curious. Uh, Littleton, Selectman. Awesome. Are you going to be picking a party? You don't have to. I haven't. Uh, I, of course, uh, for this election, I went as a Republican. I'm a Libertarian. I went as a Republican. Uh, to vote for Ron Paul, and then I went undeclared so that I could choose at the yep. uh, at the next yep. uh, election. Yep. Who else? And folks, it state rep. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. hey, neighbors. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah. Nottingham. Um, if the grounds of Republican again, the party. You also want to look and see what the majority of folks that are, have been elected there are and, 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 and the number of people that actually vote. It, it makes a difference. You might register as a Republican, but you're in a Democrat district. You set yourself up. Do you so, know Kyle Pastor? Yeah, that's right, Kyle. Don't, but I, you I think should. Someone yes. is running for uh, select. <laughs> He's a nice friend of awesome. mine and Phil. Yeah, he's he's on the same committee in the House. He's a great guy, very libertarian leaning. Yeah. What was his name again? Kyle Tasker. He lives right near Johnson's Dairy Bar. And he lives in uh, Nottingham. What? He lives right near Johnson's Dairy Bar. Okay. Johnson's Dairy Bar? Yep. Johnson's Dairy Bar. Can you run again? Frank Zabo, he's running for sheriff. Yeah. In Hillsborough. In Hillsborough. I didn't realize it was Hillsborough. Yeah. Yeah. I did not know that. Isn't that funny? That's my county. How is it? I don't know. How come you don't know me better? Okay. <laughs> Remember rule number one. <laughs> the person who's running for sheriff, is he ex-police or You don't have to be. There's no requirements for sheriff, is there? It's just another office. No, I don't believe there is. It's just that people misunderstand that. Not, not even residency. Not even residency? Not even residency. You have to be a resident of Hillsborough County. But you don't have like seven years. No, it's not like when you run for state senate and you have to be here for seven years. Um, anybody else running? Jackie. Jackie. Nashua. Awesome. Rockwell Republican. State rep. Awesome. Good. We can do some yeah. help in Nashua. Good. Okay. I'm Rosalie Bavi Ars, and I'm running for planning board, but I've been on already for three years. Got elected three years ago. But I'd like to give a little advice to this gentleman. There is the political calendar, and you have to follow the sign up rules. Have you signed up for office yet? I'm not, but they've just released the list of candidates, and there's a number of positions that just say open. Yes. No, no one even filed for them, so to me that says you can probably win with right You can do a write-in. In a write-in, write you can win. In a town, you can win it already. Right and you can't get slandered. write-in, you still got to try ahead of time, usually, to get people to come out for you, but you can still win. Well, I mean, oh. Give out. 
Yep. Um, somebody mentioned residency requirements. For those of you who haven't moved here yet, you have to live in New Hampshire so many years to run for state rep. It's two years. To run for state senate or governor, you have to be here seven years. And executive council seven also. And executive council. And but for local uh, local elections, it's usually just you have to live there. You have to live there. Yeah, it could be a month. Back in 2009, I ran for selectman in the town of Lemster. And they Lemster just, or Lemster? Lemster. Yeah. And they had just uh, gone through uh, voting against the zoning there, which uh, by a pretty large margin. And so there was a, there was a real rebel vote in that town. And I, I only lost uh, by 29 votes, and I'd only lived there 10 months. <laughs> and I would have won, but there was another guy running, a third guy running, who was kind of uh, split the rebel vote up a little bit, you might say. And this fellow we were running against was appointed because the, uh, the one he replaced, and he was appointed to replace, uh, I guess had to re resign from office due to uh, health issues. Hmm. So a lot of people were upset with this guy who was running, who was appointed for a while. And, and they, they were sort of upset about the spending and, and the fact that he was one of the ones spearheading the zoning. So uh, he didn't win by a, 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 a small margin, but he was campaigning at the dump every week. Yep. He, he I was love really the dump. <laughs> yeah. You have to be, be prepared pain. to go to the You love the dump, right? I, well, I like dumps anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to add that if you're a sort of libertarian leaning at all, it's very, very frustrating once you get elected. It, it really sucks. It's not yeah. fun. No, I. But uh, right. I agree. But, because I, I, it sucks. I hate it. But we're playing defense. Yeah. It's better us there than that's anybody out out there that's being in those positions. That's well, why we're doing it. And that's something people really have to think about. I, I wouldn't discourage anybody from ever running. But sometimes I do wonder. Where I talk to so many people, and there's some people that I meet that say they're going to run for office, and I think. I don't see it. I, if, that, if on a fluke they got elected, it's tedious. I mean, torturous. That's a better <laughs> word. It is not fun. I mean, we have fun. Don't get me wrong. We go up and we have fun. Like yeah. I sit next to a. I have a great seatmate, so I laugh all day long and make fun of everybody in the state house and everything. But um, I do. And we text each other jokes and stuff. But um, we heckle. And we heckle. But it's still tedious because you have to sit there. I mean, I, I'm on the labor committee. Do you know how many hours of testimony over whether people have a right to organize at Union I have sat through in the past year? And you know how incredibly dull it is to listen to the same union hacks tell me that we're destroying the middle class if we don't allow them to force you to join a union and pay dues. And it's like day after day after day, and they think, <laughs> This is insane. Who told me that? Yo, why, do, why am I here? <laughs> I mean, we don't do it. We don't do it. The socialists and the status and well, they, and they it's, it's, always keep coming it's back. It's a challenge because you get up there and we vote. And every once in a while we get a victory. And you know what? Yeah. Those little victories are what make it That's tolerable right. because we're moving the ball, down we're the moving the ball forward. And But I mean, some days you walk out of that state house like, I don't even know what the hell we talked about today, but it was awful. <laughs> and, 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 you know, just logical things that should, and, and, and you can't even figure it out. We passed hemp on a voice vote. How the hell did that happen? The next thing that should be simple, you have to listen to somebody drone on for an hour about, you know, cooking fire. So, Bill, so, <laughs> you run in your area? You've thought about it, right? Uh, yeah. What level would you run at? Just a local selectman or what? Uh, possibly. I'm doing, I'm doing zoning board now. You are on the zoning board. Yeah, Thanks for doing that. Sure. That's, uh, and he's in a liberal area. So and those yeah. aren't fun meetings either. You have to no. sit there for hours and no, hours. No, but they're, and... for folks who want something fairly easy, <coughs> zoning board is, uh, you get your small victories right away because you get this big, thick thing full of Supreme Court decisions that oh, I'm the only one who ever reads them. Uh -huh. and there, for basically any case that comes up, there is a Supreme Court decision to that will help you make the case to let the property owner do what they want with their property, um, and you know make you sort of bring that forward, and you're in and out of there in two hours. So. Yeah, can you give us an idea of the time commitment for that position? Where you are? Well, in a, in a in a depression, it's really easy because uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so be, before the depression hit real hard, we probably have uh, it's a small town, probably once of basically two and a half, three hours a month. Um, lately, it's been uh, a meeting every six months. So, but you, you still, uh, it's still on your CV that you know, you're on the zoning board for 
five, six years, right. whatever. We met four yeah. times, but I'm still yeah, six so, years. Yeah, so, so that's an easy one right now if anyone wants to. I, I recommend that as a, you know, at least a good place to start. Um, one thing I did think of, anybody who is thinking about running for state rep, um, especially if you're, well, obviously you're not, you're not like that, I would know that. Um, you should definitely get in touch with the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance because they're compiling a list of people who are interested in running and they are, do a very good job of um, telling people who is more likely to be pro-liberty than not. Um, they help financially sometimes. They, it's just a good base of volunteers um, and you're going to need volunteers. Um, so definitely see them. Dan Garthway here is the research director, and he can point to Anthony Pugh, who's actually the political director, who's actually compiling the names. He's upstairs volunteering someplace. Um, I would definitely say that. The other thing I would definitely tell people if they're interested in running for office, find a friend, a family member, so if you've got to pay them, if you've got to feed them, whatever you got to do. <laughs> Be the candidate and let somebody else take care of the stuff, would you say? It's easier to be the candidate if you don't have to do the stuff. So when you need to get, some, instead of spending four hours trying to find people to hold signs at the polls for you, you should be spending four hours talking to voters. Find somebody else who can find the volunteers for you and organize your lit drops and do all that stuff because it's definitely it's easy. not a one person it's really significantly easier if you are focusing on being the candidate and you can be in front of voters as much as possible and let the behind the scenes stuff get handled by somebody behind the scenes Evan? Did you? Polls to vote. There'll be people standing outside you know hi vote for Joe you know well that's great you know a few years back Phil and I decided, you know, that's a long day because we go out there at, you know, 5 o'clock in the morning and we're there at 7 o'clock at night. we got to do something to break this up. So, I don't know how many years, six years ago, we put the gas grill in the back of the pickup truck. <laughs> and we cooked hot dogs and hamburgers, except for it rained that day. But we cooked hot dogs and hamburgers because anybody who was coming out to help us, if I'm asking you to come stand outside in the cold or in the sun or any time, the least I can do is give you a hot dog. So we started with the hot dogs. Well, it's morphed. A little. <laughs> now, when we go to the polls at 5 o'clock in the morning, because we go early, because we get the right spot, because we have decided that the left-hand side of the parking lot is much more successful than the right-hand <laughs> side. But we now put up two 10 by two ten, by ten canopies with a table on it. Um, we usually have at least one or two varieties of coffee. Um, we have chafing dishes and bacon and um, frittatas for breakfast and bagels with syrup. And usually at lunchtime we serve um, a whole range of food and then we have chowder or whatever in the afternoon. So there's like this spread. So now I feel bad for the people in other wards in Manchester <laughs> because everybody wants to come to my ward because it's a party at our, but it worked, but, it, but other people have now started to come. Tammy puts the party in the Republican party. Yeah, but you know what's funny? It works. Feeding, Kevin will tell you, if I'm going to ask people to come out and walk to dropping literature for three hours, the least I can do is make a pot of chili and feed them afterwards because they'll come back and do it again for you. And that little, that is the one thing that I have definitely become known for is that I feed my, I feed people who help me or anybody that I'm working for. Not only do you get better, better caliber of volunteers that way, but you also, um, <coughs> You can also get a reputation for having the tequila after parties. Yeah, <laughs> really good. That's a good reputation. After party. So, Tammy, you definitely exciting. have to take care of your volunteers. It's just a good way to thank them for going out and walking yeah. for three hours and dropping the literature yeah. that you sh that you need to get out there. Otherwise, you'd be the one dropping it. The more people that you have helping you, the better. And the better that you treat those people helping you, the more they're going to want to help you, and the more people that they'll bring in to and help you. And it takes you. people. It ta you, you can run by yourself, and it's. A lot of work and it's hard to win. You were gonna ask me something. You have one polling place. I have one. I guess okay. I only have. It is. She has. Oh, that's not true. When I for my office, that's isn't that awful? I automatically go, yeah, just my ward. Um, when I on Phil's campaign, we only have one ward. Okay. So that's. My, so you can just put your tent there. Just put my tent there. Now, when we run for state rep this past time, we're in a three ward district, so three polling places with eight seats. 
So now I have to feed people. I know, not a, I have to feed people in three places. We didn't tent in three places, but. So we divide and conquer. Yeah, we divide and conquer. Everybody shift around and you work as a team and I'll go over here and you'll go over there and I'll all hold each other, you know. But it's hard, you only want to hold signs of people that you really believe in. You know, like, yeah, no. Um, but this time around, now with a new redistricting plan, our district gets to change again and I actually, um, well, I can say, I can go back to just running in one ward and Phil will be running in many wards. Mm -hmm. Right? And towns. And towns. <gasps> yes, Mr. Garthway. You've got all different races you guys represent in this company. You will running a little stuff. What's the ballpark figures for finances? <laughs> for zero. Name the race. <laughs> Name. Right. Well, yeah, yours is going to be the most expensive out of this um, yeah. because you're doing a whole county. Um, state rep race, I would say realistically, and I don't. Anybody can tell me. I mean, you're municipal. In the city. Uh, <laughs> we, we, I'll, um, I'll speak for my race. I'd say about twenty-five hundred dollars yeah. the first time. Yep. But uh, that yeah, expense yeah. includes a lot of signs that I use the second time, so I'll probably spend a thousand. Yep. The second oh, time around. City yeah. alderman race for most people, I'd say five thousand. Um, I'd say we maybe spent three, but I would yeah. honestly say that we're an exception to the rule. But you're, it's going to cost you. I mean, just to buy signs and one thing of literature, if you, it's going to cost you at least $1,000. But it shouldn't cost you, and okay, this is the key, it shouldn't cost you anything. If you can't raise $1,000, chances are you can't get elected. I raised $350 and did pretty well. I wasn't far, far off at the heels. And it was in the, we're going to all mark the D person. Yep. It was the year but we don't D. have that. Yes. Yeah, so then you, 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 you can win on coattails. I mean, I'm sure people in this pastime won without. But in general, you know, one district, one ward, you're going to spend any. There, there are races where you, probably you have just have to put your name on. And yep. you don't have to do anything. A lot of a lot of Republicans got elected this year just because it was their year. They put their name on the ballot. If you had an R next to it, you got elected. Um, then there's the times that you're going to be in a contested race for sheriff, and you're going to have to spend twenty five, fifty thousand dollars even more because you have a, a larger territory to cover. You have to buy literature, you have to buy yep. signs, you've got to find a way to get volunteers, and that's where feeding them comes into play. <laughs> it's not something that this gentleman's going to be able to do on his own, trying to be county sheriff. The county is one sixth of the state, right? It's six counties. Ten. Ten. ten, ten I'm sorry, ten counties. Six, so six executive he's, 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 uh, Six executive counties. So it's a it's okay. it's a we it's a large <laughs> it's a large geographical area that you're gonna have to cover and there's no way that you can knock on those doors individually on your own. You've gotta have your friends going out dropping off literature so that when they, they open their door and the literature falls off, they're like, Oh, I missed this guy and they think that you came to their door. You wanna make phone calls and talk you have you have to get to every person. If you can't have this face to face conversation with them, you don't have as great of a chance of getting your vote. Now, interesting thing in thinking about the whole county race, because that is something that's it's just more of a challenge. The bigger the district, the more of a challenge. Um, Dennis Hogan, that ran for county yeah. attorney, uh, his, from what I can figure, his methodology was he bought, you know how many voters it is, he bought X number of cases of literature, I think that's the old, and some signs, and he just went to every event he could find. If we were doing a lit drop, he came to our lit drop. If he would, if somebody was having a fundraiser, he, even if he didn't have to pay. So he was benefiting from the campaigns of everybody else in that in the county. And I really think that was where what he, he piggybacked, and it worked for him because everybody like oh, it's with Dennis Hogan again. You know, <laughs> didn't I just see you at barbecue this afternoon? Yeah. When I ran, what really helped me, because I didn't really, nobody really knew me in my town was, uh, and I was traveling a lot, and I think I started running a little, a little over a month before the election, so I didn't have much time. I wrote up a letter, I put my picture on it, and I got the uh, list of names from the town hall of all people in town, what their addresses were, mm -hmm. and, and basically I sent the letter out, I mailed the letter out to everybody in town. Yep. It was just a little, a brief one-page letter, how I felt about the things, and, it was, and then I had a meet Wayne day, with a specific yep. date and time at the general store so people could come down and talk with me about things. Yep. So it, it actually worked out really well and I didn't have to do a lot of uh, door knocking because it was a small town. Mm -hmm. it made, it, that would probably work in a big city or a big area, but in a small town, it worked quite well, especially since people didn't know me very well then. Yeah, sure. And it's an expensive way to do it. Yay. 
It cost a company two hundred dollars or so to do it. To do it between the printing and the mailing, it wasn't it wasn't bad. So you could have spent twenty five bucks on food and have volunteers go out and do it. Yeah, we did have volunteers. I am a big okay, fan good. of the lit drop versus the postal system, but it well, doesn't always work. We appreciate all you guys yeah. coming and come see us afterwards if you want some more ideas, yeah, do we'll some brainstorming, and uh, good luck to you guys that are running. We yeah, appreciate you staying Definitely get in touch with me in July. What's the best way to find out about uh, reporting requirements, regulations? Go to the Secretary of, uh, go to the Secretary of State's website. They don't have forms ready yet, but no. But if you go there and go to the Secretary, of, or you can just Google Google New Hampshire SOS elections, and it'll send you right to the Secretary of State's election thing, and it'll tell you the all the filing dates, all the reporting dates, all that stuff, and um, and at the town level, go to your town website. Yeah, but I think it's well, no, all the same. Uh, yeah, he, he could also get the same information from his city clerk. His right, but if clerk. it's for the county, it's going to be on the state website. <laughs> yeah. And, it, they, and there's a lot of information there. It, it, you can get a lot of data. You can, uh, Moody and El Emily, you know. Um, <coughs> you need to know how many people, you know, you need to know your numbers. You need to know what you need to win. I, I wasn't sure if there was anywhere else I was on. No, that's well, where actually, I would go. That's, that's, a, that's a really good point. You actually need to know what you need to, what you need to win. You can look at, you can look at a race against an incumbent and say, this guy's only ever gotten 1,100 votes. If I can get 1,200 people to say they're going to come out and vote for me and actually get them to come out and vote, I'm going to win. And you have to have a target of, of the number of people. And you have to you have to get them to say, are you going to vote for me? Okay. Write it down. Get their phone number. So that way on election day, if you haven't seen them walk past you or shake your hand to go in and vote, you call them and say, hey, I need you to come out and vote. If you can get all those people on your list and said that they'll vote for you to come out and vote for you, you're going to win because the other guy can't get past his threshold. People are already done voting for him. I will elaborate on that. I learned a very valuable lesson this year. Uh, two years ago, when we first got Phil elected to Alderman, we dotted every I, crossed every T twice. Um, Dan and a couple other guys sat at the polls, calling people and calling people all day long. Just we just kept calling and calling. Yeah, we we. Yeah. I mean, we didn't miss anything. We mailed yeah, every single up. person. We it was so intense, and we won. I think we we, we bet, much we, we, yeah, we gained the, the gap and then like another hundred some odd votes. So now we run for re-election against not a really good candidate, to be honest. But a well-known one. But a well-known, but still not a lot well-known for in both directions. Um, <laughs> and we won by 17, 17 votes. votes. You only need one and to win. And to be honest, mm -hmm. we're sitting at the poll waiting for the results. And Dan, Phil's there, and Dan's sitting here, and I'm sitting there. And I was like, I hate this. This is the worst part of the day, waiting for them to, to print that damn number. And Dan said to me, he goes, I don't know what you're worried about. We won by like six, 700 votes easy. I mean, and that was honestly what we thought. We That's killed her. And when they read the numbers, I was like, oh my god. And you know what? We didn't make any phone calls. We didn't follow up from our list. And I was like, you, oh my. And so the people that will come out and vote, but you got to make them come out and vote. Because I can guarantee, I can go back and look at the list, and I can tell you exactly I where can, those I can name lots of people that I didn't see that day that we didn't also call to say to come out make and sure vote. Come out, Make sure you come out. You've make sure you come out. Make sure you come out. So don't, of course we don't go 90% and so. then let it fall apart on that last week. Because even though you're exhausted and it's frustrating, and at that point you don't know, that's where sometimes the race is yours to lose. And we came way oh, too Mike close. Calls in house. Where? This was somebody supposed to be on my panel, but was late. Uh, Mike Ball is one of our state I, I reps. Today, sorry. He's um, he's my my seatmate next to me in the state house, and he actually runs now very libertarian Republican. So it surprises a lot of people. Nobody was expecting Mike to be so libertarian. Um, oh, I knew that. When when the radio station. Yeah, but still, you didn't really know. And um, just this past January. Um, we decided he could run the Republican Party in Manchester because, <laughs> you know, what better way to get liberty-minded people elected than to just, like, run the party. So Manchester is um, hopefully going to get more. We're going to recruit some more pro-liberty people instead of just recruit, recruiting people with ours. That's it. Thank you. Is this yours?